Good evening. That's right. Welcome to Center for Spiritual Living, Reno. It's so good to have you here tonight. I'm Reverend Karen Neuweiler, as you, most of you know. Who's never been here before? Saul? Great. Well, I'm Reverend Karen Neuweiler, I'm your assistant minister, and I am here to welcome you to session two of our sensational summer speaker series. We're doing this for six weeks this summer on Thursday nights at seven o'clock, and we'd love you to have you join us for the rest of the four of the series. Um, we've asked everybody to sit close, so if you wanna come sit closer, and um, you're, you're just in for a wonderful treat, but before we all that, I wanna remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Um, you can, uh, the only thing you can have in this sanctuary to drink is water. But certainly, if you, we have a water cooler out there, if you need a cup of water, go grab one. And uh, tonight's presentation is by Love Offering, so please remember to show your appreciation to Jeffrey and Elizabeth by giving them a generous Love Offering. So, I will let them go on introducing, and first up is Elizabeth Perti, the gracious and beautiful Elizabeth Perti. <laughs> August 12th, 2012. While visiting my family in Salt Lake City, my daughter Stephanie gave me permission to take my granddaughter, Haley, who was seven at the time, on a mountain hike to the top of Snowbird Ski Resort. We were so excited, but we started too late, and we're walking somewhere between the middle and the top when we noticed the last tram of the day going overhead, the tram that was supposed to be our ride off of the top of the mountain. And we see it going past, and my first thought is, oh no, my granddaughter and I are going to be stuck at the top of this mountain all night long, and we're going to be eaten by lions, or wolves, or bears, probably all three. I said, Haley, follow my lead. We cut off the path, and we're beelining it straight for the top of that mountain hoping like anything that we could make it up to the top. As soon as I noticed that they had landed and some of the customers or visitors were looking around and I could see some bodies, I said, Haley, follow me. And we started shouting as we're running, help, help, please wait. Help, help, please wait. Well, some passengers noticed us, they waited, and we survived our mountain adventure. Later on that evening, while I was sharing that story with my husband over the phone, because he was home working, somebody has to keep working. While he was working, when I finished the story and he was assured that we were both safe, he said, Elizabeth, so you were taking your granddaughter on a mountain hike and you nearly turned it into a disastrous occasion that would make a hilarious story and speech <laughs> well we did and it so turned out that I was in a Toastmaster I made it all the way with that speech to the Toastmasters division humorous speech contest so please help me welcome the only man I know who could take a near-death experience and turn it into an award-winning, contest-winning, humorous speech contest. My husband, Jeffrey Perti. Just so you know, I usually kiss my wife, but as soon as I went in for the kiss, I noticed she's wearing beautiful red lipstick. And I assumed that while it looks great on her, you didn't want me doing tonight's presentation with a mouthful of red lipstick. That's what we call in the speaker world a distraction. Some of you may not know, but my wife is actually the current reigning Miss Senior USA West. 
I love having Elizabeth introduce me in these programs because it's my answer to all my high school classmates that voted me the man least likely to grow up and marry a beauty queen. (laughs) We're here tonight to learn a little bit about humor, and that's what we are going to cover. Excuse me. So, in order to do that, I want to explain how this event came about. It actually started 18 months ago. 18 months ago, Elizabeth and I walked through that door. We were late, as we often are, and Reverend Karen was up giving the announcements. Reverend Karen, I looked up at the auditorium. I did not have my glasses on. And I have to tell you, when I don't have my glasses on, you look like a sea of, very attractive, but just a sea of people that I don't recognize. I stood back in that door and said, you know, that looks like a lot, a lot, like my coworker Karen Dewweiler. <laughs> but I didn't know. As we walked to, the, to our, found our seat, I remember thinking, that sounds a lot like my coworker Karen Dewweiler. <laughs> then when I picked up the program and looked, I thought, that is my coworker Karen Newweiler. So I was shocked to know that Karen was a minister in the very church that we had visited for the first time. Karen, would you be kind enough to come down here for just a second? Now I don't think you're going to mind this too much because after all, you're a minister. You're used to speaking. But I I just have a question. I'm used to being in control. Used to being in control. <laughs> Not tonight. (laughs) I do have a question for you, though. Uh, How long have you and I known each other? Probably 15, 16 years. When did you guys go first do your credit union stuff? It's about 15 years ago. In the late 90s, early 2000s, yeah. yeah. You know, when I learned that you were our beloved minister here, I, I have to say, I just have always been curious. In the 15 years we've known each other, uh huh. You don't think that might have, oh, I don't know, slipped into the conversation somehow? Like, like maybe we're talking, and, and you say something like, oh, Jeffrey, do you think you're finished that Excel spreadsheet by Tuesday? And oh, by the way, I'm a minister. But... No, I try to keep them separate, and I have only been a minister for seven years. Oh. Of those 15 or 16. So, so yeah. that's okay then. Seven years. Don't mention it to your friend of 15 years, Jeffrey. No. No, okay, no problem. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of ch- like nobody at the company knew my husband and I were going together until several years afterwards, so we know how to keep a secret. Uh, speaking of your husband, who's yes. here, Greg, yeah. you're here. Could you raise your hand? Greg Newweiler, Mr. Karen, nice to have you join us. I have to say, I was very impressed to learn. You're not only an outstanding employee that I've known for 15 years, but you were a minister. So I'm curious, do you... Do you make your husband call you reverend? No. Yes. <laughs> nice to have them both here. We get the real story. How, how about your son? No. No? You don't no. make... Oh, gosh, no. Okay, I, I have to say something here. If, if I'd accomplish what you'd accomplish, I confess I would make everybody, including my cat, call me reverend. Oh, I make the cats call me reverend. <laughs> oh, okay. Now, the fact that I would and you wouldn't, does does that make me a bad person? No. No? Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, our beloved Reverend Karen Newweiler. Thank you so much. That, my friends, is called playing on the edge because I saw her standing there and thought, I've always wanted an answer to that question. I have another announcement. Just a month ago, Elizabeth and I had the privilege of applying and being accepted in membership in the Center for Spiritual Living. Part of the process of being accepted into membership is being, uh, you have to attend a wonderful seminar given by our own Reverend Lisa for new members. It's a new member orientation. Delightful class, absolutely delightful. And one of the things we learned is the foundational book for the Center for Spiritual Living is Ernest Holmes, The Science of Mind. Wonderful book. I know Reverend has read it. Actually, Elizabeth has read it. 
And maybe some of you have read it. Folks, this thing is uh, maybe, what is this, like 3,000 pages or something? Okay. I don't have this kind of patience. I'm looking at this going, you know, if this is what it requires to be a membership, I, I may be in trouble. But I am glad to report right after that orientation, we went to Barnes & Noble. And what did I discover? Ernest Holmes, Science of Mind for Dummies. <laughs> It's a reference for the rest of us. The shortcut version. <laughs> One of the really wonderful features we have at the Center for Spiritual Living that we learned more about is the prayer practitioner. Uh, are you familiar with the prayer practitioner? Do we have any prayer practitioners here? Could you raise your hand? Could you? Another? More? More? Would you mind if I talked with you for just a oh, second? Sure. Could I invite Absolutely. you up? <laughs> now, we learned a lot from Reverend Lisa about what it's like to be a prayer practitioner. Uh, could I ask you first your name and how long you've been a prayer practitioner? Uh, Sally Young, 20, 22 years. <laughs> now, correct me if I'm wrong, you are our Prayer Practitioner Emeritus, yes, aren't you? that's correct. Please explain to us. Now, I have to admit, I didn't even know about prayer practitioners, and I really didn't know that there was such a thing as a prayer practitioner emeritus. Could you explain that to us? I can. Um, for the first 20 years that you're, you are a practitioner, there's a renewal process that involves education and recertification and so on, and meeting with your minister. After 20 years, um, headquarters, I think, has determined that you've, you've done it, you've, you've proved that, that you are a practitioner, and um, you, I think, I think we write a paper, do we write a paper? I can't even remember, Kim. She's another, but, but we do meet with the Reverend, which was Reverend Lisa Garcia, and she then approves that um, we have met the standard. And so that means, and Kim Brewer is one too, too and um, that means we're a practitioner for life. That is 20, 20 years, years of continuous service, right? That is, that is wonderful. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> now, so I have to ask you a question. This Sunday, I, I confess I didn't do this. I should have done this. But this Sunday, if I'd come to you and ask for help with a prayer to have a good presentation tonight, would you have provided me with something like that? Of course. Okay. Now, even though I didn't do that, mm -hmm. I have been praying for a good presentation. I was wondering, could I share with you my prayer and then you could give me some feedback? <laughs> that be okay? I'm giving you feedback right now. Okay. <laughs> Certainly. Certainly. Go right. right ahead. Okay. Go right ahead. So this is, this is how I've been praying. Okay. Oh, God, oh, God, please, please make it a good presentation. If it's not, I'm going to die. That's now, is why that the, I was laughing. I had a feeling. <laughs> now, is that the sort of prayer you might have provided for me? That is not. <laughs> you probably would have given me something more inspirational. Well, it would not have been beseeching because you do not pray to a God that's outside of yourself and in another place. You so, recognize the God that's already within. So next time I'm going to come to you and get a more effective prayer. As you wish. Um, <laughs> what I will tell you is um, no matter how you prayed, uh, it's working. <laughs> Our Sally Young. <laughs> now, let me ask you, Sally, and I'll repeat this. I know all stories are told to you in confidence, right? So when you're, in a when you're in a client situation. Would it surprise you to learn that somehow, some way, someone has written a book and assembled stories from other prayer practitioners? Probably surprise you a bit, wouldn't it? That would. It would? Well, you're in luck. Because at the Barnes & Noble on the same trip, we have chicken soup for the soul of the prayer practitioner. 101 stories to open the heart and rekindle the spirit. We're now going to take a little break. 
Elizabeth, how many laughs was that? 21. Okay, in approximately seven, eight minutes, you got 21 laughs. And those 21 laughs are exactly the kind of laughs you'll be able to get if you give a presentation or in your own personal life with some of the tips and tools that you're going to pick up tonight. Now we're going to take a little break. You have notepads before you, and you'll see past the cover that I have an uh, opportunity for you to take some notes. What I would like you to do is pair up. People just pair up with one other person for the next 90 seconds, just discuss some of the items that caused you to laugh. Then we're going to talk about them afterwards and why you may have laughed at those items. And if anybody needs some handouts that came in late, please raise your hand. We'll bring them to you right now. Handouts? No? 90 seconds. Go. See? I told you it would be a little funnier. <laughs> Yes, just the first question. Good question. You're just doing the first question about what made you laugh. And time. Okay, let's hear from some people, and I'll repeat what you tell me so that we don't have to run around and do a uh, microphone check for the moment. What made you laugh? Anybody? The book covers. The book covers. Yeah. All right. Those, yes, those are the parody book covers, and the principle is it's shocking and surprising because they're familiar with titles that almost everybody knows. I have to say the other principle is the more specific the humor, the more funny the humor. And in, in my programs, I almost always do 100% customized humor. People expect it. They don't, they don't want a canned presentation anymore. So every presentation is customized for ever the audience. So you like the parody book covers. What else? Yes. Sally, our prayer practitioner emeritus, was a wonderful straight man, straight person. Perfect. She fed the lines perfectly. She even, did you notice even she started laughing when I was telling her about my own prayer? You know, and what that does is that seeds it. It's like everybody in the audience go, oh my gosh, what's coming here? So we didn't rehearse it. We didn't rehearse any of this, but it was perfect. So wonderful straight. If, if you ever give up this whole prayer practitioner emeritus. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. What else? Rodney? Not taking yourself seriously. You know, it's funny, Rodney, that's a great point. And uh, uh, what, are the, what are the advantages, I have to say, of being old is you've made so many mistakes in your life, like me, that it's hard to take myself too seriously anymore. <laughs> Come on, so that's a great one. Don't take yourself too seriously. Yes? And 
Well, thank you. And the smile, the look on your face, by the way, I'm glad you pointed that out because we're going to play a little bit of a scary game here. I'm going to relax my face completely. Just, I'm not going to do it. Just, this is relaxing my face. Oh, okay, there's no need to start crying. It's, it's not that bad. Uh, yes, my n normal face looks so grim that if I were to deliver presentations looking like that, nobody would laugh. They would wonder, what is wrong with that man? So that's a very good comment. Yes? Um, lightheartedness, yet truthful. Uh, you know, that is so good. Thank you. Lightheartedness, yet truthful. All humor, almost all humor, must stem from the truth. If it doesn't stem from the truth, it really doesn't make any sense. So you start with the truth as the anchor to almost all humor. Great observation. Anything else? Your wife's introductory story was just really set the tone. <laughs> Wasn't that great? An absolutely true story, too. Uh, we've even got photos of it, and she's got photos of her trying to chase down the tram, and oh, unbelievable. But of course, now, I'm glad she pointed out, I first asked and made sure that she and her granddaughter were safe. That's number one. And as soon as you learn that they're safe, you immediately start thinking, oh, this is going to be a great story. This is going to be a great story. You went hiking with your granddaughter and almost killed you both. Oh, this is going to be funny. <laughs> okay. Let's move on to the next question on the same page. Why learn humor? And in this one, just toss them out. Do you have an idea? Why are you here? Greg. Burns calories. <laughs> humor burns calories. You know, I have to tell you, as long as I've been giving this presentation, that's a first. And clearly, and clearly, for all my love of humor and presenting, it has not worked for me. <laughs> But in theory, yes, it burns calories. Why else? Learn humor tools. Releases endorphins. Releases endorphins. Yes, absolutely. Uh, you should connect with my wife. She's also into this whole healthy thing. So <laughs> I'm sure you'd have a wonderful conversation. Why else learn humor? Yes. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Humor helps you connect with other people. That is absolutely true. It is so true because we like to be around people who make us laugh. We like to be around people who have a lighthearted touch to their life because that tends to infect in a good way all the rest of us. Now, someone else I saw end up... Pardon me? Yes, that's a great one to get through life easier. Wonderful reason to learn humor. Now, um, at the bottom of the page, any, any others that I missed? I want to make sure. Elizabeth. I think it helps relieve stress. Helps relieve stress. Absolutely true. By the way, interesting thing about stress, I used to have a hobby of reading mountain climbing books, and one of the things that you will learn when you read books like that is how often in moments of high stress, with their lives on the line, the mountain climbers start laughing, almost uncontrollably somehow, because it's the only way they can think to relieve the high tension that they are under. So that is a very good point. At the bottom of this page, there is the first of the items that you might want to guess at. Anybody can guess a, a quote from Jeffrey Gittimer. At the end of laughter is the height of joy. That's a good one. That's a good one. Not the one he said, though. I think I'm going to change the quote, though. I like that so much. Learning. Learning. Jeffrey Gittimer is a master of sales training presentations. And as he said, if he doesn't have his trainees laughing, they aren't learning. And this is one of my favorites at the very bottom. World champion Darren LaCroix said, As a speaker, you only have to use humor if you want to... Live? <laughs> that seems kind of harsh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, good try, but that's not the answer I was looking for. Anybody? Pardon? Pardon me? Be listened to is very good. Engagement, very good. Be remembered, very good. Those are excellent answers. Pardon? Make a sale. Ding, 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 ding. His exact quote is, you only have to 
Uh, use humor if you want to get paid. Get paid. That's it. You, winner, yes. Okay. Let's move on and learn some actual humor tips. Now, let me start off with a question. Who among you thinks that humor is a gift from above, handed out only to those special chosen few by the humor God above, and the rest of us are bereft of any opportunity? Go ahead. Be honest. Anybody? Good. Honest people. Wrong. <laughs> Humor is a skill that can be learned like any other skill, like, like accounting, which is what I am, like welding, whatever a skill, humor can be learned. Now, it is true, some people have a better facility for it, just like some people have a better facility for accounting. But I have to tell you, I have learned these tools of humor that you're going to go over tonight, and may I be honest for just a second? Nobody is less funny in this world than accountants. We don't have the funny gene. It's just not built into us. So everything I know about humor, I've learned, and then I apply it. And that's what you have to be willing to do. Learn the tools and techniques, and then apply it. So as you can see, we're going to start with tip number 10. Now, this is the point in the presentation where those of you who are musically inclined might want to cover your ears. In fact, if one of our musical directors was here, he'd probably be up in that booth right now, covering his ears, moaning in pain. But you know what? It never stops me. <clears throat> I want you to imagine something. By the way, in case you're curious why I'm not using a pick or an amplified guitar, you don't want to hear my guitar. <laughs> I just do it for a prop, really. I'm not very good at this whole guitar thing. <clears throat> Imagine, it's the morning, and you are getting up, big smile on your face. You're going to practice those 10 humor tips that you learned tonight. You can't wait to start the day in a happy, joyful experience. You turn on the radio, and over the radio comes a voice of classic country singer, George Jones. I woke up this morning aching with pain. Don't think I can work, but I'll try. The car's in the shop, so I walked all the way. Oh, these days I barely get by. Oh, great. Now you've ruined the whole day all because you listen to country music. So that's your humor tip number one. Don't listen to country music. Hey, some of these I just do for me. <laughs> I actually like to listen to country music, but oh, some of it's kind of depressing. However, I am awfully proud of my three years in a row Worst Country Singer in America award, so I got that going for me. Humor tip number nine. Humor tip number nine right in front of you. Any guesses on what we use humor to do? Two words. Any guesses? <laughs> this one's kind of difficult, and this is just mine. We use humor to uplift and inspire. Now, do I have anybody here who attends comedy clubs? Any comedy club fans? Elizabeth, <laughs> anybody else? Well, Elizabeth, since you're in the front, let me ask you. As a general rule, how would you describe the tone of humor at a comedy club? Well, a lot of times it's more caustic. Caustic, yes. Uh, sarcastic. Sarcastic. Kind of hurtful. Kind of hurtful. At somebody else's yes. expense, usually. It's usually at somebody else's expense. That is the general tone of most comedy club type humor, and that's what comedians often do. Now, not all of them. There are some 
positive comedians, but as a general rule, comedians tend towards the caustic and sarcastic. For a humorist, I think it should always be inspiring, uplifting, uplifting, positive, upbeat. And one of the reasons is, as you learn these two humor tips and apply them, sometimes the humor is not going to work. I know, you're shocked. The humor couldn't work. Well, it happens all the time. But the nice thing is, if you've been positive and uplifting, it doesn't really matter that much because people go away feeling good anyway because you've not said anything critical about them that they can misinterpret. It's been upbeat, positive, and just um, very inspiring. Humor tip number eight. My friends, this is where I ruin comedy for you forever. Forever! You will see me in the street someday, and you will come up to me, and you will say, Jeffrey, you ruined comedy for me forever. <laughs> Are you going to do that? No? Yes? Probably. Just won't admit it right now, right? But you will, won't you? Yes, you will. I forgot what it is. I had to remind me where we are. Get, get a little too worked up here. Number eight. People laugh when their minds are successfully tricked. You now know the secret for all humor, all comedy. George Carlin, the wonderful comic for many years, explains it this way. It's like a train is coming down the track. You've got an expectation that that train is going to keep going down that track. And all of a sudden, boom, it derails off to the side. You have been fooled because that was not what you expected. Your mind has been successfully tricked. And if you call back to Elizabeth's opening, did you expect her to say after that story that we turned it into an award-winning humorous speech? Those are the sorts of comedy tricks and humor tricks that cause people to laugh. So that is the absolute anchor. People laugh when their minds are successfully tricked. 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 Humor tip number seven. This comes from Steve Allen. Comedy equals tragedy plus time. Again, calling back to Elizabeth's opening story. Elizabeth? Could I have you stand for just a second? By the way, she's going to love this because I didn't tell her I was going to do this, so I'm sure I'll pay for this later. But Elizabeth, take yourself back to your hike with Haley. What were your actual feelings at that time? Not now. What were your actual feelings? I was really scared to death. If we miss that tram, I have horrible knees. Uh, I, I would rather lay down and wait for the snow to come and bury me and have somebody <laughs> find me the next season than try to make a trek down this hill because where the trams go, that's high. You know where they have a tram? And we had gone most of the way up. Yeah, I was, I, I was scared to death of missing that tram and the way down because it was already getting dark by this time, and I knew we would be in the dark, no other tram, and I really was worried about lions or wolves or bears. <laughs> I really was, and I thought, oh my gosh, you know, I'm going I'm to be responsible for killing my granddaughter and myself. What a, what a way to go. Did you ever think you would turn that into an award-winning humorous speech? Never. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth, award-winning humorous speaker. At age 20, 20, I married my high school sweetheart. Lasted seven months. Anybody want to guess when I knew that marrying my high school sweetheart was a mistake? Anybody? Anybody? Pardon me? Uh, not quite. Very close. It was the honeymoon. The honeymoon. Yeah, that's pretty sad. But it lasted seven months, and... I'm not sure, that was about six months, 30 days too long. We won't go into it. But I will tell you this, how do you think I felt at the time? Miserable. Terrible, awful, miserable. How do you think I feel now? Great. Great! Great. <laughs> Best thing that ever happened to me. 
<laughs> My note. Oh, thank you. <laughs> so humor equals tragedy plus time. Now, if you look into your own life, I'll bet some stories pop up immediately that you think at the time, worst thing that could ever happen. I'll never recover. I will never get over the hurt and the pain. And now you look back and what? Laugh uproariously, don't you? See, there you go. Humor tip number seven, comedy equals tragedy plus time. Humor tip number six, and we've changed the page. Use comedy formulas. Now, I'm not a comedian. I consider myself a humorist. But comedians are those people that go up on stage every single week with the sole purpose of making people laugh. So it would be silly for us not to take advantage of all they have learned. And one of the things they've learned is much comedy can be done with formulas. You're going to learn those, at least a couple of those formulas tonight. Formula number one, under humor tip number six, use the rule of three. Three is a magic number. I don't think it's an accident that in the Catholic faith we have a holy trinity. In fact, you probably were taught in school that when the caveman first came out, looked into the sun, and the language is about to birth, he said something like, fire. Right? Yeah. Wrong. <laughs> I have it on good authority that when the first caveman went out, looked at the sun and the sky and the earth, he said, three. And it's been that way ever since. <laughs> Three is a magic number. Now, when we get to the exercise, you'll know exactly how we apply that magic through rule of three. The next formula underneath, underneath that is it takes 10 to get two. Now, there's no easy way to explain that one, so we're just going to wait to the exercise. So I ask you to hold that to the side. Comedy tip number five Use the comedy structure of, now this is somewhat widely known. Does anybody know what that one is? The comedy structure of close. Set up, punch. Set up, punch. If we go back to the George Carlin train analogy, the setup is creating the expectation of that train, keeping on that same track. The punch, whoosh, off the train goes to the side. Set up, punch. That is the anchor for almost all comedies. Now, if you left here tonight learning how to write a joke, that's right, write a joke, the same way comedians do, would that be a value to you? Say yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm going to ask Reverend Karen if you, and I'm sorry, Judy, if you would be kind enough to grab the microphones because this is going to be audience participation time. <laughs> All right. We are going to write a joke. Now, if you flip over to your next handout on the page right after it says, let's write a joke. Can you give us the fill-in of the rest of five? Oh, I'm sorry. Setup creates the expectation must come from the truth. Punch changes direction. Punch changes direction. We are going to write a joke, and in the process, we are going to explain some of these comedy formula tools. And here's the joke we're going to write. Because we are at the Center for Spiritual Living, we are going to write a joke about... Now that's a first. Oh, that's better. I really am not used to people reaching around and grabbing my ear and playing with it for no reason I can figure out. I, I had witnesses. So. Oh. We are going to write a joke on the essentials for being a persuasive minister, even though I didn't know she was a minister. We won't go into that. We are looking for characteristics. Now, Remember, 
we want to create the setup first, then the punch. So the first thing we're going to do is have 10 logical, reasonable, true characteristics for a persuasive minister. And if, pardon me? Yeah, that'd be great. I'm going to have my lovely assistant and wife go ahead and write these. <laughs> and Karen and Judy, if you would be kind enough, when you raise your hand, please wait for them to come around with a microphone because we want everybody to hear. So, who has some essential, logical, true characteristics to be a persuasive minister? Please raise your hand. Patience. Patience. That's a good one. That's first number one. Another one? Charisma. Charisma. That's an excellent. Words. <laughs> You're going to have ten them. here, so you might want to write a little smaller. Sincerity. Sincerity. Perfect. These are great. Spiritual. Spiritual. Good. Go ahead. Wisdom. Wisdom. Very good. Right here. Compassion. Compassion. <laughs> Compassion. Go ahead. A good speaker. Good speaker. That's a great one. Good speaker. Where are we? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We need three more. Three more. Humor. Humor. It's a great one. Humor. Truth. Truth. Outstanding. Education. One more. Education. Education. Got it. Good. Okay, two, four, six, eight, ten. Remember, we did ten. I'll explain this, but it's, this is the foundation for the it takes ten to get two. It takes ten to get two. Now, here comes the fun. Forget just the specifics of being a minister. What is the wildest things you can think of that someone would use as characteristics to persuade you of anything? Same exercise, wildest things you can think of. Just raise your hand. Doesn't matter what it is, doesn't matter how outlandish it is. Go ahead. I would say if you have a repetition of like, can I have a hallelujah? Uh, repeti uh, yelling. yelling, call yelling. Yeah, yelling, that's good, yelling. Right over here. Putting a gun to your head. <laughs> <laughs> okay, gun, just put gun. Well, I'll explain why we're just playing gun, right? Enthusiasm. Enthusi um, that's more. Good. That's more, that's more, yeah, that would be more on this side. We're looking for outrageous. I hope our ministers are enthusiastic. Um, being demeaning. Um, a demeaning person? Demeaning? Yes. Okay. Mean, yep, that's pretty outrageous. <laughs> oh, right behind you. Unloving. Unloving. That's a good one. Manipulative. Manipulative. That was a good one. Manipulative. Sarcastic. Sarcastic. That's good. Boy, this is a church I don't want to go to, but <laughs> let's keep going. Sarcastic. So we're at six. We need four more. Four more. Outrageous clothes. Yeah. Crazy clothes. Crazy clothes. Crazy clothes. Okay, keep going. We need three more. We're not stopping till we got ten. Scandalous. Scandalous, that's good. Intrusive. Intrusive, that's good. Where are we? Two, four, six, eight, nine. One more. Gossip. Pardon me? Gossip. All right. Gossip. All right, perfect. Nice hand for our assistants with the microphones and for Elizabeth. Oh, it doesn't work that way. I'll do it. Okay. Now, we get into the comedy formula, the rule of three, and it takes ten to make two, and set up punch. That's why this exercise is so great. You actually learn three of the critical phases of writing a joke. Look at the bottom. It says you need a persuasive minister. To be a persuasive minister, you need just three things. So, what are we doing with our setup? we're going to establish direction, aren't we? That's why we have all of these logical ones. So that you can say, for example, to be an, a persuasive minister, you need patience, you need charisma, you need compassion. That's true, and it's absolutely the characteristics. 
Not funny, though. And we're all about funny here. So we don't want to hear that. Karen, take a note. We don't want to hear that. What we don't want to hear is the kind of joke we're going to learn tonight. So let's do some looking here. Which of these jump out at you? Let's have some voting here. Patience. Do you like patience? Just raise your hand for a vote. Not much. Charisma. Charisma. Yes. Oh, we got one, two, three, four. Put four for charisma. Sincerity. There, got it. Oh, we got one, two, three, four, five, six for sincerity. How about spiritual? Spiritual. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Ooh, twelve. Spiritual. That's that's leading. Wisdom. Wisdom. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven for wisdom. Compassion. One, two. Ooh. Whoa. One, two, three, four, five. Keep them up. I don't count that quickly. One, two, three. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19. Ooh, 20 for compassion. A good speaker? Good speaker? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 20. Okay, 23. Ooh, humor? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Truth. 1. Six. And? Education. Education. <laughs> Education. One, two, three, four, five. Five. Okay, what are our two winners? Good speaker had the most, and right behind that was compassion. Okay. So, good speaker, compassion. Now, let's explain a little bit it takes ten to make two. This is what actual comics do, and here's why. Very often when you are doing this yourself, or at least when I'm doing it, because I'm lazy, you get the first two, three, and you go, close enough, I'm going to make a joke, boom. However, people who treat humor very seriously realize that sometimes the very best ones come later, after you've struggled with all the obvious ones. Then you start really having to pull out of your mind, all right, what else, what else, what else? So if you do this exercise, I encourage you, don't quit until you've forced yourself to write down 10. Because very often, in fact, as many times as I've done this exercise, do you know we have never voted for any of the top five? Never. It's always something in the bottom because it tends to stand out and grab us. Oh, that's on you. Oh, that's a little bit different. So that's the, it ten, takes 10 to make two. Now, same thing with the outrageous one. And we're going to contrast it with compassion and good speaker. Actually, let me get on this side. Okay, votes for yelling. Yelling. One, two, three, four. Four. Votes for, okay, I'm glad that whoever put this up here. This is an important principle in humor. And that is, it's really critical to be aware of the events going around in the world. As you know, we recently had a tragedy. So I would not for months after a tragedy like this have any firearm-related humor items, even if it was the winner, simply because that's the sort of item that, in a recent tragedy, will cause people to kind of react negatively. So we're just going to scratch that one out for now. Demeaning. Demeaning. One, two, three. Three. How about unloving? Unloving. One, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Eight. How about Elizabeth? I'm sorry. Manipulative. Manipulative. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Sarcastic. Twenty. Whew, that's a big one. Crazy clothes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. Thirteen. By the way, this one rings with me. I was raised Southern Baptist, heavy evangelical, and I saw so many, uh, so many. Well, we called them preachers, not ministers, but so many preachers wearing white suits that I assumed that that's the way all preachers had to dress in white suits. Anyway.
<sighs> scandalous, scandalous. One, three, four, five, six, six. Intrusive, intrusive. One, two, two, and a gossip, a gossip. Ooh, one, two. Twenty-two, and the winner is gossip. Gossip, all right. <laughs> gossip is the winner. Okay. Now, if you look at your handout, what this would be is a setup that creates a joke that looks like this: to be a persuasive minister. You need just three things. Good speaker, compassionate, and a gossip. <laughs> now, here's the funny thing. You knew what was coming, and you <laughs> laughed anyway. That's the power of this, of this formula, and that's why comedians use it. Another interesting story. We were watching the 2008 special with Ellen DeGeneres laughing. And Elizabeth and I were watching, and at least three times during that, Elizabeth says, rule of three, rule of three. Professional comedians use this exact technique to create it. Now, you can't do all your jokes with this because it begins, begins to get repetitive. So they will intersperse it. In fact, I think Ellen had three jokes that we clearly identified were created using this technique to show you how fun this can be. This morning, preparing for the presentation, I went through this exercise myself and created the following two jokes. When I started as a speaker, I had hopes, I had dreams, I had hair. <laughs> Same exercise. <sighs> My dad taught me three critical lessons for success. Work hard, be honest, inherit money. <laughs> and you, too, can do exactly this exercise to write your own jokes. Now, I don't generally write jokes. However, I still go through this exercise when I'm working on a humorous speech because it really focuses your talents, finding the key humorous item to pull out and create a humorous Humorous joke that you can share with friends. Let's pause for a second. We've written a joke together and covered several critical humor tips. Any questions at this point? Yes. The, thank you. The question is, the questions you ask to actually create the joke, what are typical questions you ask? Well, one of them is right there, uh, uh, to be a persuasive minister. So it's a pattern. You need three things. But it can be anything, anything. For example, pick a hobby. Someone give me one of their hobbies. Basketball. Pardon me? Basketball. To be a great basketball player, you need three things. I don't know what they are. But anyway, that's the way you would process. Another Another hobby. Fishing? I have no idea what you do with fish. I mean, I don't get fishing, so no. <laughs> to be a great fisherman, you need three things. By the way, I'm pretty sure the third one would be beer, but I don't know what the other two would be. <laughs> it's the same formula. You can do it for your job. You can do it for hobbies. You can do it for people. You know, to be a great runner, I mean, it, it really, it's a, it's a, that's why it's such a wonderful formula. It is so flexible. Great question. Any other questions? <laughs> All right, let's move on, shall we? Humor tip number four. To fill that in, it is use funny words, words is correct. Who said that? Very good. Words and? That's a good guess, not the one I'm looking for. Use funny words and voices. voices. That would be good. Jokes. No. 
gestures, these are all good answers, but the one I'm looking for is numbers. Numbers. Use funny words and numbers. The first line is, odd numbers are funnier than even numbers. <laughs> My wife was previously married. Not a surprise when you consider that we we're on our 60s when we got together, <clears throat> late 50s. But uh, having learned she'd been married previously, I instantly turned that into my wife's previous 17 husbands. Why? It's a great exaggeration, and it's an odd number. Now, you might think that's a little bit odd. However, Elizabeth then started using it in some of her humorous speeches to get a big laugh, referring to her previous 17 husbands. Why? 17 is a funny number. Two, not a funny number. Four, not a funny number. 17, funny number. Seven, funny number. Odd is, now anybody, anybody know why odd numbers would be funnier? Because they're odd. Because they're odd is the correct answer. <laughs> Truth is, I don't know. It, it just is. <laughs> okay, the next one. Words with a hard sound, but the one I was spe specifically looking for is K. But yes, and any hard sound numbers are funnier than any words with soft sounds. For example... If you have a joke that you've written with fish, no, 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 no. It's a mackerel. Mackerel is funnier than fish. It has a K sound, and it's just a funny-sounding word. <laughs> and those make a big difference. Get fish to a punchline, you don't get a laugh. Mackerel, you laugh just because it's a mackerel. <laughs> uh, some words... Go ahead. Some words are just plain funny. We all have our lists... As a humorist, I keep a list of words. Here's some of my favorites. Weasel. I don't know. I think it's funny. Jethro. I just think that's a funny name. It always calls back to the Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> Jethro. Who, by the way, who would hate their kid enough to name him Jethro? Is anybody here named Jethro? Okay. Whew. That was close. <laughs> if you write a humor referring to a lady... Uh, uh, Lady, not a funny story. Woman, woman, not a funny word. Cupcake. She's a cupcake. Cupcake is a funny word, and it's a funny way to refer to a lady in the context of a joke. Now, gentlemen, if you start referring to ladies as cupcake in person, you're going to get slapped. I'm just telling you. <laughs> but when you're up on the stage and they can't easily reach you, cupcake is a word. Jello. And here's my all-time favorite. Kickapoo joy juice. Now, who's old enough to remember... Are you? Where is it from? Pardon me? El Cap, the little Abner comic strip. Who else knew that? Oh my gosh, that's amazing. No, the Kickapoo Joy Juice. If you're going to refer to alcohol, and assuming the audience is old enough to get the reference, Kickapoo Joy Juice will get a laugh, even if the rest of the joke is awful, just because you said Kickapoo Joy Juice. And another tip, specific, anybody? Specific name brands is correct, are funnier than generic. You never tell a humorous story about a can of soup. It's a can of what? Campbell's. Campbell's is correct. You never talk about a small car that you rented. It's a yeah. Kia. That's a good one. Kia, I like it. K sound, and it's a crummy little car. All right, <laughs> sorry. Who owns a Kia? I'm, you know, I'm, oh, <laughs> wonderful car. Love Kias. Okay. <laughs> uh, it's never toilet tissue. It's what? Kleenex. Charmin. Kleenex. Charmin, right. And it's never, never peanut butter. It is? Skippy is correct. Skippy is a funny word. It's a K sound. You will get a laugh just because you said skippy. All right. Humor tip number three. We're coming into the home stretch. Use the power of the callback one of the most powerful humor principles that you'll discover. A callback. One word, C-A-L-L-B-A-C-K. A callback. A callback is to a previous funny item that happened. It could have happened in your speech. It could have happened during the day somewhere. It could have happened a week before. It could be in the news. You could call back to the news. You could call back to previous events in your family. Now, here's a, here's a funny, 
thing that we do. Um, I have a delightful stepson-in-law named Brady. He's a outdoorsman, Hunter Fisher. Hunter Fisherman, see? I don't know what the heck he does either, but anyway, some kind of outdoor thing. He told us a story about the attention span of dogs. He always goes hiking with a dog. And he, he says, you know, you're out hiking with the dog, and here you are with Rocket, and you go, oh, Rocket, I love going hiking with you. And of course, Rocket looks up, I love hiking with you, Brady. And, and, and I love you, Rocket, and, and I love you, squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> and that's the way dogs are. If you're a dog owner, you know. It's like, oh, oh what a wonderful day. It's so beautiful. Squirrel, squirrel, squirrel. <laughs> well, since Brady told us that story two years ago, Elizabeth and I can always get a laugh out of each other when we've gone off the side track and say to the other, squirrel. <laughs> One word callback to a family story, and it always gets a laugh. And you have family stories, and that's one of the powers of this tool. You can call back to those family stories. If they're well-known enough, one word will get a laugh. Squirrel. Elizabeth. Does that include music? Because sometimes the callback is a song. Yes. And a song that we knew from way back when will make us laugh our heads off. The question is, can it be music? It can be anything. It can be an event. It can be music. It can be a concert. It can be a family story. It can be history. Something that happened today, as long as it generates that humorous reminder, boom. As a speaker, I'll tell you a funny story. Often the callback gets a bigger laugh than the original line. It's really an amazing power. Humor tip. Number two. You didn't the point. Oh, sorry, you're right. Uh, the callback is often funnier than the original line. Humor tip number two, which is like humor tip number three, because it has the same number. <laughs> the rule of three. That's right, the rule of three. <laughs> but it's really humor tip number two. Tell stories from about your own life. Now, I can't tell you when I coach people how many people come to me and say, Jeffrey, nothing funny ever happens to me. And I almost always solve that with one question. Do you have children? Well, yeah. <laughs> what are you kidding me? Those children are like walking speech material. They're like walking story files for you. We have a member of my home amp Toastmaster clubs. Every time he gives a speech, he talks about his kids. And it's funny every time. So you have hilarious stories in your life, and we want to hear those stories. We really do, because that's what makes us all fascinating. That's what makes us wonderful individuals. Humor tip number one. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, 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 I'm jumping ahead. Most effective humor begins with the truth. Good one. You've got this one by now. And if you're serious about humor, create your own story file. That's what I do. Sometimes it's just one word, but it reminds you you've got that story. You can incorporate it in your family stories. Humor tip number one. By now, you probably have got this one. Humor is a skill, correct, that you can learn. That is the power of humor. You don't need any innate ability. You can apply the tools you've learned tonight. You can actually use these techniques. And if you use these techniques, you will get the laughs that you so richly deserve. And I have to tell you, as a speaker, as a humorist, folks, this stuff is better than crack cocaine. When you tell a story and people laugh, oh, I mean, it's just a wonderful feeling. Now, of course, I wouldn't know anything about drugs, but I threw it out there anyway. I know nothing about it. It's like, what? Oh, I will. Thank you for reminding me. Because we were coming to that. <clears throat> Any questions about these 10 <clears throat> tips? You're probably thinking, does that wrap it up, Jeffrey? No, not yet. Because I have another, what? Story. Story, that's right. As I mentioned, Elizabeth and I are blessed to be members of Center for Spiritual Living. 
One of my favorite moments of the lesson that Reverend Lisa taught us was when we got time to pass around the cards to join. Reverend Lisa stands in front of the room and says, at this time, will the assistants please close the doors, bring in the chickens, let the sacrifices begin. (laughs) Obviously, she meant it as a joke. What she didn't know is, as you now know, I was raised deep evangelical Southern Baptist. I'm sitting there on the front row, and my first thought was, yeah. I knew it. This is my kind of church. In fact, I was just one minute away from leaping from my feet and shouting, preach it, Sister Lisa. There's going to be a healing here tonight. And thus, we decided to join, because this is my kind of place. (sighs) Thank you so much. On the cover, I skipped right over that. And you're probably saying, well, Jeffrey, why did you skip over that story? Because I forgot. (laughs) Hey, you're covering a lot of material. Sometimes these things slip by you. Elizabeth and I, when we met, I was fortunate to get an email from her. And attached to that email was a beautiful photograph. And what that email said was, Jeffrey, you probably don't remember me, but uh, I used to dance with our mutual dance instructor. And I would like to get in touch with you, if you wouldn't mind. I opened the photo, and there was a photo of probably the loveliest woman I've ever seen. And all I could think was, in over five decades, this has never happened to me. (laughs) Come on. (laughs) So what do you think I did? I picked up the phone and called her right away. You think I, I wasn't going to let this slip away? We met for lunch the very next week. I learned she was looking for a dance partner. I happen to be a ballroom dancer, as is Elizabeth. So we agreed to become dance partners. By the third dance, third dance, I knew I wanted to marry her. Now, I confess it took about six months to convince her. <laughs> And one of the main tools that I used was humor. I made sure that whenever we together, whenever we were together, she had a wonderful time. Look, folks, can we be honest? I mean, I, I think we've bonded here today. She's not going to pick me for my looks. Come on. <laughs> so you got to have something else. And humor was the tool I used. So you're probably a little bit surprised. You thought you were coming here for a humor workshop, actually. It's the Center for Spiritual Living Dating Service. That's right, we're going to carry all up. How to find the man or woman of your dreams through the effective use of humor. Thank you for that reminder, Reverend Karen. I, I close with this. Have you ever noticed how often in life some of the activities that cause you to have a philosophy of life happen early in your life, and you keep that attitude for the rest of your life? For me, it happened in the year 1973. I was 16 years old. Yeah, I see some of you doing the math. Okay, 16, 1973. Man, that guy's old. Yes. I worked a year construction with my father, who, did I get this off again? Hold it. Let me see now. Can, is that better? More like it? Okay. I want you to hear me, but I don't want you to hear the guitar. So, um, I worked a whole year construction with my father in the hills of eastern Tennessee. Now, at the time, eastern Senate Tennessee was coal country. <clears throat> I would work outdoors in the construction. I'm young, 16 years old, fit. It was a great job. But every day at 3.30 thereabouts, the shift for the coal mine ended, and the coal miners would come home. 
And I would see them, and they would be covered head to foot with coal dust. They would go inside, and they'd take a bath, and they'd come out, and they'd often talk to us, because we'd often be working till 6 or 7. It was summer. And they still had that coal dust embedded within them. And that summer experience gave me the lighthearted look I've had with life ever since. And you're probably not going to be surprised. Let me scoot over here. This is my favorite part of the presentation. <laughs> you're probably not going to be surprised that as a man who proudly wears the title of America's worst country singer, I wrote a song about it. You're probably also not going to be surprised, if you have particularly astute ears, that this song sounds suspiciously like the first song I sound. <laughs> well, there's a reason for that. I only know two songs. One of them is George Jones, These Days I Barely, barely Get By, and the other one, Ain't. <laughs> You've likely had troubles just like me. You've wondered if you had a use for the humor tools to be. But no matter how troubled and challenged your life may be, at least we're not digging coal in the hills of Tennessee. Jeffrey. Are there any questions for Jeffrey? We'll be here as long we'll as anybody else is here. We have a little survey that we, the little yellow, uh, we have a little survey that we pass around that we'd like you to fill out. It doesn't take a long time. We just kind of want to get your opinion. So if you would uh, please fill that out before you leave and then also leave your love offering in the basket. If you have any questions of me, I'd be, I'll be here for a while to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you for being here. I truly enjoyed having you. Thank you, Jeffrey. It was a lot of fun. Did you have fun? <laughs> Made me laugh. And next week, we have uh, Donna Hartley, who has been here before. She's going to be talking about how she flunked heaven three times, flunked entrance to heaven three times, and the things that she's learned from that. So she's an internationally known speaker. And as I said, we've had her here be many times before, and she's lots of fun. So please join us for that. Thank you for being here tonight. Hang around and, and just uh, enjoy the evening. Have a safe trip home, and we'll see you on Sunday. Sunday, in case you don't know, 9, 15, and 11, and uh, we'll be happy to see you. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you very much, Jeffrey.